This is my first time in Lithuania, yes. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the weather has not been very cooperative, so I haven't been able to see much of it. But it has been a, a, a pleasant visit uh, inside the conference. It is my first time ever at a Build Stuff conference, and uh, I really didn't know what to expect. And then I, I got here, and there's 800 people, and there's lots of energy. and. And uh, it was good to see. It's good to see uh, lots of programmers that are, that are passionate about their career and about their work uh, coming together and talking about pretty interesting things. So I, I've attended a number of talks that have been uh, fascinating. Um, and you know, where else are you going to go and see uh, you know, Mel Conway? Framer of Conway's Law, talk about data flow projects. It was very cool, very cool conference. Uh, I've been in this business for uh, uh, over 50 years. Uh, and so I've, I've gone through, just, I've made just about every mistake you can make. I've been fired from a few jobs. I've screwed up projects left and right. I've done all kinds of things that uh, I would now be able to tell people not to do. In fact, a lot of, a lot of my writing is based on, um, gee, I did this once, you really shouldn't try it, be a bad idea. So um, I'm not quite sure it's, it's um, a, 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 a hidden secret. You know, the secret to my success, if you want to call it that, is just making tons of mistakes and recovering from them. Oh boy, yeah, I wish I could go back and talk to that young man and give him a little advice. Um, pay attention to the business you're in. It's not just about the technology. Learn something about the business as well. Um, be, you know, learn continuously. This is not a problem I ever had, but it is a problem in our industry, I think, that, that um, some people believe that they come out of college, they've learned Java, and now they have a job and they're done learning. And you cannot be done learning in this, in this industry because the industry is changing overnight, all the time. So you, you always have to keep learning, you always have to keep uh, trying new things. Every programmer should learn a new language every year. That's something Dave Thomas used to say in the Pragmatic Programmer's book, but it's good advice. You know, learn a new language every year. Uh, you don't have to use it on your job. You should just play with it at home. And that's another thing I would advise people. Um, you work for your employer for 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week or whatever it is, but you also have to take some time for yourself, uh, for your career. You have to take some time to study and to practice. So if you're really dedicated to your, your career, you should probably be doing 10 to 20 hours a week of that as well. Um, which means that you're going to be putting in an awful lot of time. 40 hours for your employer, 20 hours for you, that's 60 hours. And is there time left for life and family? And the answer to that is it's a difficult trade-off. Uh, but if you're going to be a, a software professional, it's the trade-off you have to make. Uh, it does take a lot of effort and time, and it's worth it if you love it. Uh, that's probably true. I don't remember the exact year, but it was, it was probably around 2010 when the, when the Craftsmanship Manifesto was put up. Um, how do I see that proceeding? It's, in some ways, it's discouraging because the, the Agile Manifesto and the Agile movement was supposed to be um, the vehicle that carried the value of craftsmanship forward. And something happened to the Agile movement that, that uh, has disturbed me now for a long time. Uh, it, it became a focus of the business side of the issue and not the technical side. And Most of the Agile uh, community now is focused on project management and business focus. And there's very little technical excellence uh, associated with it. Now, the craftsmanship movement started as a reaction to that with the hope that it would create a reunification. And it really hasn't created that reunification, at least not yet. So it concerns me because I, I believe these two, these two movements are going in separate directions. And I think they need to come together. 
So it bothers me a little bit. We are headed for a, uh, a crisis in professionalism. Uh, and I believe those two have to be together in order to resolve that crisis. We came really close with the Volkswagen affair, um, and it may still precipitate the crisis. Uh, we came very close with the, um, the American healthcare website. Uh, that was a disaster. Um, at some point, um, some, some software disaster is going to motivate the governments of the world to take action and regulate uh, the software engineering community. And if we are not prepared before that event, uh, then we won't be able to control the events. The events will control us. And uh, that won't be good. We need to be there first. We need to know what our profession is, what our disciplines are, what our standards are, what our ethics are. All of this has to be decided, and decided pretty soon, um, so that we can, we can present to our governments um, the standards for uh, regulating software, because I believe we will be regulated. So that's a fascinating question. Um, what will programming look like 10 years from now? So there's two sides to this. The first side is that our tools have been um, becoming more powerful at a, a ridiculous rate of speed. Uh, our computers got Im immensely faster and more powerful. We, we started with tiny bits of memory, and now we have virtually unlimited amounts of memory. The speed of our machines was at first ponderous, and now it's, it's incredibly fast. The, the cost of the machines used to be very high, now it's very low. Um, so over the last 50 years, we've seen this really wild expansion in the hardware and in the software tooling. The compilers and the editors and the IDEs have gotten really, really powerful. On the other hand, the languages have changed very little. Um, the technology of software itself is almost exactly what it was 50 years ago. We started out, uh, once we got a compiler like Fortran, uh, with if statements and loops and assignment statements, and here we are today with if statements and loops and assignment statements and very little new has been added to that. You could say that object-oriented programming was a, an addition. I actually think it was a subtraction. I think object-oriented programming was a set of disciplines that allowed us not to use pointers to functions. I think that structured programming was a set of disciplines that allowed us not to use go-tos. And functional programming, I think, is a set of disciplines that allows us not to use assignment operators. These, these paradigms, structured, OO, functional, all took things away from us. They didn't add. They took capability away from us, uh, to impose discipline. If I, if I took a programmer from 1965 and I moved him through time, and in fact from 1965 it would likely be a woman because there were a lot more women in the field back then. If I took that programmer forward in time and put them in front of a modern laptop running Eclipse uh, and showed them Java, um, they'd be very surprised by the technology. Uh, they'd be, they'd be you know, flabbergasted by how powerful it was. But within 24 hours or so, uh, they would be writing code because the code is just not that different. Uh, and they'd see Java and they'd go, oh, what's this Java thing? And I'd, I could explain classes and within a day they would be writing the code without any issue. So there's not a lot of, in 50 or 60 years, there hasn't been an awful a lot of extra stuff to learn. By the same token, if I took a programmer from today and I moved them back in time to 1965, uh, they'd be very disappointed, of course, in the tooling, and it'd be a, you know, a deep 
<laughs> blow to have to edit code on paper tape. Uh, on the other hand, they could write the code because the code is not that different. So you asked me the future. If you look at those two trends, I think we can see that the, the tooling will probably continue to get better. Although maybe not as fast as it used to. Moore's law for speed has kind of been reached. Uh, density will still increase, but we may be on a much slower curve from now on. Um, so perhaps the tooling will get better and better and better still. But the languages will remain what they are. Um, there will still be if statements, there will still be while loops, uh, and probably there won't be any major revolutions in, in the software itself. We'll still be having lots and lots of languages because we always do. We seem to always create new languages, but the new languages are really just rehash of old languages. Uh, there hasn't been a truly new concept in a computer language in probably 40 years. Um, and that's a little disappointing as well, but it seems to be the way it goes. The tooling side of that, we'd kind of expect the tools to get better, but it may be that we have approached a, a knee in the curve of our technology where um, it's, it will still get better, but it'll get better at a much slower rate of speed. I don't know that that's true, but it possibly is. That certainly happened to airplanes. You know, airplanes, uh, the Wright brothers flew in 1903. Uh, within 40 years, we had jets screaming through the sky. And now, 60 years after those jets, we still have those jets. And OK, they're a little bit better. But you see a 747 flying through the air, you think, wow, that's a pretty cool jet. But that was invented in the 60s. Right, so the technology rose like crazy, and then it kind of leaned over, and it, it improved gradually. I, and I wonder if we're at the knee of that curve, even in our software tools. It's ironically, it was the first of the, of the programming paradigms to be discovered in 1957 or 1958, uh, but the last really to be adopted. And we really haven't adopted it yet. Uh, but we're, we're becoming much more interested in it. And the reason we're becoming interested in it is because of Moore's Law. Um, the processors aren't getting any faster. Clock rates kind of stabilized out at 2.6 gigahertz 10 years ago, and they haven't gotten any faster. And so the hardware developers have been adding more processors. And at first they put two in, and then they put four, and pretty soon they'll put eight, and so on. And we, programmers, need a way to deal with this environment with multiple processors. Now, one way to do that, one way to, to get your arms around multiple processors is to eliminate the difficulty that we have with concurrent update. You know, a lot of programmers have problems with threads. Uh, threads are complicated. Threads are simple, though, compared to multiple processors. So you could think of multiple processors as um, very scary threads. And, and what, are, what is the difficulty we have with threads? Well, the, the difficulty we have is race conditions, concurrent update issues. If you, uh, if you eliminate assignment, if you remove the ability to change the state of a variable, then you can't have a race condition. You can't have concurrent update problems because you're not updating anything. And that's what functional languages do. They, they force you into a mode of programming where you cannot assign a value to a variable. You can initialize a variable, but you can't change it once it's been initialized. And if you can't change the state of a variable, you can't have race conditions. So the theory is that functional programming languages will be very useful for these you know, multi-core machines when those machines have you know, 1024 processors or 4096 processors. I'm starting to wonder if we're going to see that, though. Are we going to see laptops with more than four? I mean, that laptop that you're using probably has four. Yeah, four cores. That's pretty standard now. Um, will the next one have eight? 
A few years ago, I thought that would be the curve. I thought, well, okay, the next one will be eight, and then 16, and then 32. I wonder if that's the case. I wonder if, we, if the next one will have eight. Maybe it won't. And maybe the whole multi-core thing was a fear, and it really isn't going to manifest quite the way we thought. So it'll be interesting to see how the next few years work out. I have no idea. I really don't know what happened. Um, it, it looks like it was an event. Uh, if you look at the curve of the percentage of women in computer science, that curve was tracking women in other uh, engineering disciplines like astronomy and chemistry and uh, other, other forms of engineering and biology uh, until about 1975 or four, somewhere around there. And that curve just suddenly starts going down. And it goes down very precipitously so that within about 10 years, the number of women has dropped from somewhere around 20% to somewhere around 2%. And then it just, it's just stayed flat ever since. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly what it is. It's, it's something that I've been concerned about for a long time because when, you, when I go to a programming uh, shop, when people invite me to their, to their companies, I see a bunch of young men. And maybe I see one woman or two women. If I go to a conference like this one, I see a bunch of young men. Uh, there are a few women, but not very many. So that's, con that's concerning. I don't quite understand why it is. Have we somehow turned the software industry into a men's locker room? Is it, is it so uncomfortable for women to come into our industry because we, programmers, expect men? And so we behave as though they're all men, and, and we behave as though we're in a locker room, uh, joking around and talking and using all of the language that you might in a men's locker room, and here come the women, and, and they hear that, and they just leave. I don't know if that's the issue. I don't know if that's what's going on, but maybe that is. Um, I don't know what the event was, why that curve suddenly went down. It does correspond with another event, however, and the other event that it corresponds with is the um, uh, first computer science courses in college. The first real computer science graduates would have been coming out of school and getting jobs right about the time that the number of women started to plummet. So maybe it had something to do with the, the recruiting at the colleges. Maybe the colleges were recruiting young men and not young women. Or maybe the women who got into the courses uh, somehow got chased out by the men. I don't know. But it's a very interesting problem, and it's, it's a significant uh, issue. Uh, our, our industry is almost the only one that is so incredibly dominated by men. I don't know how to address it. I don't know what the cause was. I don't know what the issue is. Um, so I'm not sure how you would address it. I don't want to do anything silly like um, uh, having special women's tables at conferences or you know, special women's programming club, especially if it's a bunch of men who are trying to organize it. So uh, I, f I actually feel very helpless about the situation, other than uh, just talking about it and you know, waving my hands and saying, hey, this is an issue, and I don't know what to do about it. I, I, I imagine there's some women around that have a much better idea about what to do about it than I would. We, are a, um, we programmers have a certain kind of literacy. We know how to read a certain language and write it. And not very many people know this. Most people cannot read and write the language that we read and write in our career, which means that we have a special form of literacy. We are literate in this language, whereas most of the world is illiterate in this language. Now, how do you, how do you get more people to be literate? Well, you train them from a very young age. There are people who reach a certain age 
and for whatever reason, you try to teach them programming and you can't. They, they don't learn it. Uh, it's as though their brains have gotten wired in a certain way and it, their brains can't accept the concepts that we programmers think are very natural. Uh, and, and this point has been driven home to me many, many times as I have tried to teach people who are older uh, how to program a computer. And, and the, the information often just cannot get in, can't get in. And I, I try to explain, and it doesn't get in. And I don't know what to do about it. So getting them young, I think, is a good solution to that. Now, I was fascinated today by um, Mel Conway's lecture because he gave this, this really beautiful description of a data flow language that he'd been working on for 20 years that I, I didn't know he'd been working on. And his idea was, he put up this, this image of a, a, a woman um, at a potter's wheel making a vase. And he said, if you want to teach people how to program, don't show them source code. Don't teach them about compilers. Don't teach them about algorithms and, and logical statements. Give them a tool that's sort of like clay, something that they can manipulate in real time and see the effect instantly and be able to know what to do. I want to make the neck narrower. I want to make the, the opening of the vase wider. They can see it. They can feel it. They can touch it. Uh, and so he was putting on the screen these models that looked sort of like wiring diagrams or maybe plumbing diagrams that would instantly behave. You didn't even have to tell them to start. You would just put these items on the screen and they would instantly behave and, and create behaviors that the author was, would be able to then adjust and mimic and, and fiddle with. And he, he said this fascinating thing. He said the... It should be transparent. I, I don't remember all the six or eight things he said, but one of them was should be transparent in that they should not know that there's any computing going on underneath the hood. It should just be that they're touching it with their hands and the action happens. It should be instantaneous. It should be driven by feedback. And that struck me. I thought, well, that, this is a good idea. How can you teach children uh, programming if you've got to introduce them to Java? Yeah. And just the learning curve for Java is, is ridiculous. Can you get them to put their hands on something and manipulate it quickly? And I think you can. I think he had a good idea. And I think some other ideas like that would be very good as a way to introduce concepts and start the passion, and start the interest, and then you can move into uh, the more detailed stuff. So that's how I would hope that would go. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's, it started a long time ago, and, and uh, when I was very young, the, the first computer, real computer, that I learned to program on was a PDP-8. Um, and, and how young was I? I was probably 16. And I would... Um, I would drive, my father would drive me uh, 30 miles to the digital equipment sales office where they had a floor model of a PDP-8 and the, the office managers there would let me play with it. My friends and I, we, we would come in on a Saturday. This is how I spent my Saturdays during, during school and spent many of the days in the summer vacation as well going to the digital sales office and playing with a PDP-8 and learning how to manipulate this machine. Years later, and it, it had been years since I'd seen a, a PDP-8, but I was working at a company and, and there was some trash in the hallway. And I, I just happened to peer in the trash bin and there was three front panels from a PDP-8. Um, three different PDP-8 front panels. And I thought, they're in the trash. So I grabbed them, and I took them home. And a few years later, I had them framed, and I hung them up in my office. And ever since then, I've been thinking, OK, I've got these front panels. Now I need to have a real PDP-8. But where do you get a PDP-8? And then I, 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 um, 
last year I wrote a simulator for a PDP-8 on my iPad. And I made it look like a PDP-8 with all the lights blinking and all the buttons and paper tape and stuff. And made all, makes all the noise, you know, the noise of the teletype and the noise of the paper tape reader, just, just for the, 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 the memory of it, the nostalgia. And I, I, um, I tweeted about it and I put it on Facebook and someone I knew sent me a, 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 mail, a letter saying, well, you know, I've got two PDP-8s in my basement. And I sent him a tweet back and said, well, you're going to sell one of them to me? And he did. He sold me one. And now I have a PDP-8 in my office. It's a, an original PDP-8, a uh, straight-8 PDP-8 from 1965. It doesn't work exactly. Turn it on and the lights come on, but something was wrong with the memory. I'm going to have to fix it. But I bought myself an oscilloscope so I can probe it out. And I'll probably get it working sometime in the next year or two. <laughs> but that's just a small hobby. And, and it's, you know, it's kind of like the guy who, who um, in his 60s, like I am, goes out and finds that first car he drove when he was a teenager, right? And he... He gets it and he polishes it up and he restores it. Same kind of thing for me. It's the first computer. <laughs> I think the thing that is most important for us as an industry now is to um, develop our disciplines. And the discipline that most concerns me is our, our testing discipline. Uh, I am an advocate of test-driven development. I have been for many, many years. And I, I believe that that is the appropriate, one of the appropriate disciplines for uh, software developers going forward. Now, it's nice because I, I will ask a, a group of people uh, how many, excuse me, how many are doing test-driven development? And nowadays, I will see 15 to 20 percent. Had I asked that five years ago, it would have been 5 percent. Had I asked it 10 years ago, it would have been virtually none. So I believe the discipline is on the rise. I think that's a good thing. For those of you listening to me, this is a discipline that you want to learn. Do not, if, if you don't know the discipline, don't start practicing at work um, because it will disrupt your work. Practice it at home. Learn it at home. And, and give it a good shot. Give it some time. Spend three or four weeks practicing the art of writing tests and learning how to write them first and, and going through the discipline as, as it is written up in a whole bunch of blog, blogs everywhere and get good at it at home before you bring it to work. And by the time you get good at it at home, you'll probably have convinced yourself that uh, it's also a necessary discipline. Once, once you've done it and done it well, it's really hard to not do it. Makes no sense.